Hello, good evening. Hi, thank you all for coming. My name is Mark Williams. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening to our event with Lawrence Lessig. I have a few quick thank yous, very important thank yous, and a brief introduction uh, before we get underway. And there should be time for question and answer. I hope there will be plenty of question and answer. Uh, first of all, thanks to the Rana and Edward J. Goldstein 1962 Fund for Distinguished Visitors in Film Studies. Goldsteins are very generous and have put us in a position to invite very distinguished speakers here to Dartmouth. Thanks also to my colleagues, the staff and students of the Department of Film and Media Studies. Uh, thanks especially to the Nelson A. Rockefeller Center, directed by Andrew Samwick, the Dartmouth College Library, directed by Dean Jeff Horrell, Dartmouth Computing Services and Research Computing, directed by Ellen Waite Franzen, the Institution for Security, Technology, and Society, directed by Professor Denise Anthony, and special thanks to a few individuals, Sarah Morgan and Sadna Hall at Rocky, and Jaime Combaritza and Kathy Moore at Research Computing. Without them, this literally would not have happened, so I very much appreciate their help. Lawrence Lessig is director of the Edmund J. Safra Foundation Center for Ethics at Harvard University and professor of law at the Harvard Law School. He's the founder of Creative Commons, one of my favorite entities on the planet. Also the founder of the Stanford Center for Internet and Society, a former board member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and is, not surprisingly, affiliated with the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. He's won numerous awards, including uh, the Free Software Foundation's Freedom Award, and was named one of Scientific American's top 50 visionaries. These are among many credits and accolades. He's internationally rena renowned as a leading authority on issues of copyright, free culture, and intellectual property in the internet era especially, and is an advocate for the internet as a specific kind of commons, a commons of innovation, a commons of sharing. What I appreciate most about his work as a media scholar is his attention to what we might call the architecture of media in relation to their affordances, functionality, and capacities. And in this he's been influenced uh, quite a bit by Jokai Benkler's notion of layers of media the content layer, which I think most users and much of scholarship is directed toward, but also the logic code layer and the physical or material layer. And what distinguishes uh, Dr. Lessig's scholarship in this regard is his capacity to recognize the significance of each of these layers in their own right, but especially to discuss them dynamically in relationship to one another. And in doing so, he has a terrific uh, awareness of and recognition of the significance of media history in thinking through these affordances and the choices that we make. He knows that technology is not something that is God-given, it's something that's man-made, and that the choices we make are very significant. And he recognizes the precedents that one can draw upon in media history in thinking about these different choices. So across his writings, he might discuss early radio, he might discuss contemporary cable television, he might discuss the laying of network wires for telephony, he might discuss the gramophone. All of these are uh, in his wheelhouse, if you will. Um, he also discusses these issues in a great degree of detail and complexity, and this I think is also important. He doesn't simplify things, he doesn't try to be reductionist about them. He actually wants us to understand them in their complexity, and I very much appreciate that as well. Uh, the relation between media studies and the media and the broader topic of tonight's talk, democracy, is perhaps so self-evident as to almost be invisible to us at times, because we know that democracy fundamentally is based upon a well-informed citizenry. And without question, the media are an extraordinary influence and determinant on our access to information, our use of information, 
our capacity to call ourselves informed. So just as a gesture to some of the contexts in which we might consider uh, tonight's lecture, a brief survey of very pressing issues in, in media and media scholarship today. We all know that there's a great deal of concern about the status of journalism. The ec economic model for a lot of traditional forms of journalism has apparently gone away um, so that there are people trained and excellent in what they do who maybe don't have an opportunity to perform that task anymore. At the same time, the 24-7 cable news environment and the blogosphere, while having many benefits, have for a lot of people also coarsened uh, the, the discourse of politics, creating a kind of world of hyper-binaries where democratic dialogue seems to have turned into blood sport, and this is a great concern. Uh, another concern, contemporary concern, is our impending changes to the rules regarding media ownership and the consolidation of media ownership. You can imagine how that might make an impact on our capacity to be an informed citizenry. And lastly, uh, impending changes to what's called net neutrality, which is going to potentially affect whether the ISPs that provide you your internet access can weigh the content that they actually provide or the, or the capacities for you to exchange information in significant ways. So these are all very pressing concerns related to our democracy today and I think should serve as a kind of a context for uh, Professor Lessig's remarks. He, he has a very provocative title, Rebooting Democracy. Please welcome to Dartmouth College, Lawrence Lessig. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I'm extraordinarily happy to be here. Uh, in my family, there's a branch of the family called the Cateses, and all of them went to Dartmouth, and they were the coolest people in our family, way too cool for me to ever really get to know well. And so I couldn't come to Dartmouth because I knew I wasn't quite as cool as they were. So I'm happy at the end of my life to be invited back here uh, to Dartmouth and finally make my presence here. Um, they'll be really impressed. Uh, uh, about that at least. So what I want to do is tell you first some stories. Three stories that set a framework of how I want to introduce this question of what we need to do if we're going to think about how democracy gets remade. So the first story. This is the body of a 12-year-old. Many such bodies inspire people to begin to think about this problem of childhood obesity. This study just recently released by the Center for American Progress describes some of the costs of childhood obesity. For example, type 2 diabetes, the sort of diabetes that people used to only get as adults. Now, half of the people who get type 2 diabetes are kids. Three times the number of kids in 1980 as today are obese from the government's perspective. One third of kids over two are obese. And the costs of this are extraordinarily high. Obesity, as this report says, has likely accounted for up to $147 billion annually in direct care costs. And that is, of course, growing. Now, why is it our kids are facing such a crisis in obesity? Well, when I was a kid, I was extremely fat, and I was convinced it was genetics that uh, did it. So, but the problem is that. Genetics doesn't quite explain the whole chunk of people who've become extremely fat. It's not like we're experiencing some ra radical new <laughs> explosion of X-Men types here. No, it's because of what we eat. That's why our kids are increasingly obese. And there's a consensus among people who know something about it that what we do is eat too much of this stuff and not enough of this stuff. Actually, not precisely this stuff. It's not sugar. It's increasingly high fructose corn syrup, a commodity which, account, which is in 40% of the foods sold in supermarkets. 40% have high fructose corn syrup in it. Now, why is it this magical formula has spread itself so broadly in our foods? Well, it's because it's extraordinarily cheap, or at least cheap 
relative to sugar. And the free market people in the room might then say, well, that's just the way the market works. Corn syrup is cheap, sugar is expensive, so therefore the market separates out the two and we have a prevalence of corn syrup. But it's not quite that simple. Sugar is expensive because the United States protects domestic sugar producers through tariffs. The producers get about a $1 billion bump in their annual income. There's about six of them major producers in the United States. It costs the economy about $3 billion in lost productivity, but that accounts for the two to three times the world price for sugar that we pay for sugar in the United States. And secondly, corn, of course, is subsidized. In the last 15 years, $74 billion has been given to corn producers to produce corn, making corn actually cost less than the cost of producing it to the society. Now, these two shifts produce a radical shift in how food gets made. And if you saw this fantastic food film, Food, Inc., you saw the extraordinary push towards factory farming, in particular cattle that are raised on corn, creating a problem for the cattle because, of course, their stomachs were not made to produce or to digest corn, requiring a massive amount of antibiotics being fed to these cattle to deal with the diseases which they get because they consume corn filtering out an increasingly virulent set of salmonella, which increasingly infects our food supply. All of these because we've made corn extraordinarily cheap. Now, why do we make that decision as a society? To increase the cost of sugar and lower the cost of corn. There's only one answer to this question. It is campaign cash. As the Washington Post reported, during the 2004 election cycle, two Florida sugar companies gave a total of $925,000 to election coffers to continue to support the longstanding policy of Republicans and Democrats alike to restrict the free trade in sugar and thereby subsidize the sugar manufacturers in the United States. And of course, ADM, very famous company, you see them every Sunday morning on Sunday morning television shows. ADM has spent literally millions of dollars to continue to support the subsidy to corn, which leads to the production of ethanol and the continued spread of high fructose corn syrup in our food. And so, campaign money distorts the market, which distorts food production, which distorts the body of our children. Indeed, if you look at the price of vegetables over the, last, over the period 1997 to 2003, vegetable prices went up by 17%. But because of these subsidies, the cost of a Big Mac went down by 5.4%, and the cost of Coca-Cola went down by 35%. Meaning the market is now tilting us to unhealthy eating, but tilting us because of the government's intervention in the market. Yet, those who bemoan this transformation, those who worry about what our kids eat, those who identify the health consequences of this problem, are almost oblivious to the government's role. Indeed, this report that I pointed to at the beginning had one sentence addressing this particular issue. As they said, the reason for such pricing biases is highly contested. As a formerly trained economist, it's kind of hard for me to see how it's contested. You subsidize one, the price goes down. You tear off the other, the price goes up. But, but further investigation into agricultural policy is necessary in order to determine how it impacts food prices and consumption. Punt is what we call this. OK, second story. We've all been focusing on the disaster caused by Wall Street's behavior in the economy over the past couple years, disaster which in 2009 produced this very unique map in the history of the last 100 years where the countries that actually grew were the undeveloped, underdeveloped countries and the countries which collapsed were countries like ours. Now, why did we have this economic result? Well, I recommend strongly this book, 
by Simon Johnson and James Quack, 13 Bankers, that tells a history of the relationship between the banking industry and government regulation. And the short version of the recent history goes something like this. 1929, we had a collapse of the, of the market. It was very bad. Things were very, very, very contracted throughout the economy, and that led to a resolve that we should have the government come in and do something to stabilize this market. And what the government did was to adopt a simple principle of oversight of the financial markets, oversight at least where there was finances involved. Basically, every major instrument of the financial services market, bonds, stocks, savings, would be supervised by regulators, aka regulated by regulators, according to three simple ideas. First, that the instruments would be public, their trades would be transparent, and there would be anti-fraud requirements built into the markets that govern those trades. In the 1990s, <clears throat> there was a radical wave of innovation in thinking <laughs> about these financial instruments. The innovation was we should deregulate them. And new instruments that were invented, derivatives and the uh, ilk of those new instruments, would now be private in the market in the sense that these old requirements of public, transparent, anti-fraud mandates would be inverted. There was no public requirement, no transparency requirement, not even an anti-fraud requirement into the trades of these instruments in the over-the-counter markets. Now, what nobody ever realized, because we didn't actually have the numbers to make the calculation until very recently, is the radical shift in proportions that this new deregulation market produced. So in 1980, according to uh, uh, one scholar who's written about this, in 1980, probably 96 to 97 percent of the financial instruments were in exchanges governed by these public rules that I described. And two to three percent were over the counter in the private markets. By 2008, that number had reversed itself. 90% of our financial instruments were being traded in these underground shadow markets where nobody could know what the rules were or what the trades were or what the requirements of fraud or transparency would be. And obviously that shift created the conditions for the bubble that ultimately burst and brought the economy down with it. But that wasn't enough for Wall Street. That deregulation wasn't enough for Wall Street. What they also wanted was a bit of re-regulation. Basically, a government guarantee that when this bubble burst, they would get a bailout from the government. Now, of course, they got that. They got that, as Quack and Simon described, the series of signals by the government that if things went wrong, the government would step in, led the very actors to behave more irresponsibly, producing, as Krugman and many others have described, socialized risk and privatized benefit, the kind of socialism of the 20th century, where we, the taxpayer, cover all the risks, but they, the gamblers, get any upside to these gambles. Now, from a public policy perspective, this is insanely stupid policy. <laughs> so why do we do it? And the single most dramatic change over this period of time, tied to an ideology that supported this deregulation, was an explosion in campaign cash into the Democratic Party and Republican Party, driving both of them to sing the chant of deregulation throughout the period from 1996 through the collapse in 1998. Yet, yeah. even though the government was so centrally responsible for setting up the conditions under which banks could behave badly, when Congress passed the rules setting up this institution, the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, which as you see from their website says they will examine the causes, domestic and global, of the current financial and economic crisis in the United States, this commission is by statute explicitly forbidden from focusing on the government-related causes. Congress's behavior here, the Fed's behavior here, those are off the table. What we need to do is to figure out the causes that have nothing to do with the actual causes to this collapse that might have caused this collapse. That's story two. Here's one more story. Everyone knows on April 20th, 2010, we had this extraordinary event happen in the Gulf. And this new 
famous website, which gives us a constant feed of the information about the constant flow of oil into the Gulf, has become one of the top sites on the web. According to estimates released today, about 37 million gallons of oil have now spewed into the Gulf. And just to keep that in perspective, the Exxon Valdez released 10.8 million gallons of oil into the Prince William Sound, making it, as was finally declared by the government clear today, the uh, worst spill in history, far worse than the Exxon Valdez. Now, many people wonder how it could be that we set up such a system to produce such a disaster here, right? Wasn't there at least an environmental impact or risk study done to figure out how they would deal with such a catastrophe or whether such a catastrophe was probable or even likely? Because, for example, I come from Massachusetts. We've just gone through this process of deciding whether we're going to build this wind farm, which, of course, at the Cape Wind uh, project will be an extraordinary new innovation of providing clean energy. And, uh, and we have for 10 years been reviewing this question. And over those 10 years, there have been 10,000 pages of environmental impact statements filed to justify this finally approved project. What about with offshore drilling rigs? What's the environmental impact statements required in that context? Well, these rigs are not actually governed by the EPA. The EPA doesn't have jurisdiction over this question. The entity that has jurisdiction is something called the Materials Management Service in the Department of the Interior. You might have heard of these guys because they are in bed, literally in bed, with the <laughs> oil industry. There's a scandal of them actually having sex with the oil industry, people inside and engaging in cocaine use and all sorts of activities as they celebrate their happy union of interest between government, the regulator, and private industry, the regulated. This is the entity that was overseeing the safety of the projects that built these rigs offshore. So how many pages of environmental impact statements did this entity require BP to file before BP could be responsible for building that rig? 17 pages, which was enough to get them exempted from further requirements evaluating economic and environmental impacts from this rig, uh, and resulting, of course, in the extraordinarily clear underpreparedness of everyone for exactly this kind of catastrophe. Now, of course, when this all came out, Congress was shocked, <laughs> shocked, reminding me of this extraordinary testimony by Alan Greenspan. Those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself especially, are in a state of shocked disbelief. I'm shocked, shocked. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Right, they were shocked. <laughs> they were just completely shocked that this had produced that result. Yet, of course, as everybody should remember, it was Congress that had required that the Materials Management Service be the one responsible for this review. And Congress had required that they approve these requests to build these rigs within 30 days of the application being submitted. And that rule was produced by an endless amount of campaign funds that led Congress to change the ordinary procedures that would have governed such an extraordinarily dangerous environmental activity. Okay, those are the three stories. Here's the lesson I want you to draw from these three stories. All three of these stories are about a certain kind of obliviousness. And I want us to begin to get over that obliviousness by beginning to learn how to connect the dots between projects and concerns and public policy issues that we care about to recognize an underlying cause or source to the misfunctioning that we observe. What is our response to that underlying source? Because the kind of learned obliviousness that we have developed in our modern democracy to the cause of these mistakes is the first 
thing we need to remedy. The kind of learned obliviousness that families have when you know, like the drunk Uncle Bob, who constantly has <laughs> series of problems that we try to understand as, you know, maybe they don't like him at work, or maybe his car really was misfunctioning, never actually addressing the fact that the reason Bob is suffering so much is because he won't get over his dependency on alcohol. We need to learn not to see in order to survive in those families, but what I want to suggest is that we need to learn to see the cause to these underlying problems in our government if we're going to address them, the source, and to identify then how to respond before it is literally too late for this democracy to respond. So what is the source to these problems? Well, my view, this is described perfectly in an extraordinary book by Robert Kaiser, So Damn Much Money, which tells the history of the change in Washington over literally the last 25 to 30 years. And it's a change driven by a radical change in the industry of lobbying. And as Kaiser describes it, we need to understand lobbying now as a kind of economy, an economy that has three components, lobbyists and members of Congress and the interests that those members represent. Each of these elements pays the other and each is increasingly dependent upon the other. So lobbyists pay members, both during their time in Congress and after their time in Congress. During their time in Congress, lobbyists pay members with cash. And I don't mean the cash of brown paper bags. I don't mean bribery. This is the cleanest Congress we've ever had in the history of the United States Congress in that sense. I mean instead the cash as in support for their campaigns. As the cost of campaigns has gone through the roof, members become increasingly dependent upon this campaign cash. Members who spend between 30 and 70% of their time raising money to get back to Congress or to get their party back in power begin to look at these lobbyists as suppliers, or to push the metaphor a bit, the lobbyists as pushers inside this economy of dependence. Now, this is something new, Kaiser says. As Kaiser puts it, money has been part of American politics forever. On occasion, in the Gilded Age or the Harding administration, for example, much more blatantly than recently. But the scale of it has just gotten way out of hand. The money may have come in brown paper bags in earlier eras, but the politicians needed and took much less of it than they take through more formal channels today. So compare, for example, this man, Max Baucus, a man who represents 0.3% of the American public, a man who was arguably the most powerful man in the United States Senate governing health care policy. During the time which he governed health care policy, his campaign coffers received about $4 million in contributions from the health care industry that he was regulating. Compare Baucus with this man, John Stennis, senator from Mississippi. No choir boy, John Stennis. But when Stennis was in charge of the Armed Services Committee in the 1980s, he was asked by a colleague to hold a fundraiser for defense contractors. Stennis's response to his colleague's suggestion was, would that be proper? I hold life and death over these companies. I don't think it would be proper for me to take money from them. Now, Kaiser's point is that this ethic is totally unrecognizable in Congress today. The idea that you wouldn't leverage your power as the head of a committee into an extraordinary amount of money from those who would be regulated by the regulations of your committee is completely naive. The sort of stuff that only professors at elite law schools might talk about, but not the sort of stuff that politicians understand in their bones. That's the way politics is. And from their naive perspective, that's the way it's always been. But it hasn't always been like that. And then after their time in Congress, members of Congress get paid by the lobbyists. The lobbyists pay them with their future. As my friend Jim Cooper, congressman from Tennessee, puts it, Capitol Hill is increasingly a farm league for K Street. Members and staffers and bureaucrats increasingly have a common business model, a business model focused on their life after government, their life as a lobbyist. 50% of the senators between 1998 and 2004 left the Senate to become lobbyists. 42% of members of the House. Increasingly, everybody on Capitol Hill depends upon this system surviving, making it 
a system that reinvents itself to assure that nobody can challenge the future prospects that each of these people have for their income after they leave government. That's how lobbyists pay members. Then members pay the interest through policy that gets changed, sometimes extraordinarily profitably. So this University of Kansas study about lobbyists return on investment for amendments to the American Jobs Creation Act estimated that the return on, on lobbyist dollars spent was 22,000%, explaining why more and more businesses begin to believe that it's better to invest their money in lobbyists in Washington to improve their bottom line than to invent another great mousetrap. Or this study just released last year in the American Journal of Political Science calculated the return for lobbyist dollars spent in getting tax rates lowered through targeted tax benefits and similar uh, activities. And they estimated that for every dollar spent by large companies, they could lower their taxes between six and $20. Again, an extraordinary return suggesting why there is an amazing growth in money spent in lobbying in Washington. And then sometimes brazenly, the members and the interests do their dance. So the New York Times had this story at the beginning of February about Chuck Schumer traveling to Wall Street to raise money for the Democrats and for himself, but facing a very chilly reception from Wall Street. As the paper put it, the city's titans of finance at a recent closed door meeting accused him of being insufficiently pro Wall Street. One indignant fellow stood up and demanded his donation back. Now, this is Chuck Schumer. There is no member of the United States Senate who has, not, who has bent over backwards more than Chuck Schumer to turn over the whole control of Wall Street to Wall Street itself. Yet this man is insufficiently pro-Wall Street according to Wall Street. And that kind of threat begins to have an effect. So these are the top 10 managers of hedge funds last year. I want you to tell me how much they made on average last year. Can you guess? OK, you're the first person who has ever gone over the number. <laughs> Their average income was $2.5 billion. I never did very well in math. OK, well, <laughs> the new math you seem to be doing pretty well at. OK, $2.5 billion each. OK, now, how much do they pay in taxes on that $2.5 billion? Near to zero. Well, nearer to zero than the rate you pay, 15% is the rate they pay on that income because of a loophole in the way that our tax system works. Now, Obama, when he came into office, said, we're going to change that. Took the idea to Capitol Hill. Democrats, especially on Capitol Hill, said, hell no. You change that, those guys are going to be really mad at us. And if they're really mad at us, we're not going to be able to raise as much money from them as we used to raise. So we're not changing that. Those guys get $2.5 billion in income and pay 15% taxes on it, and there is not a revolution about that. Yet that's the power the members give the uh, interests that they regulate. And then the interests pay the lobbyists. Lobbying has become a huge industry in Washington. It's about the size of the recording industry in the United States. This man, Gerald Cassidy, the man who is uh, uh, probably the inventor of the way that earmarks currently get used. He's amassed a fortune of $100 million from his lobbying enterprise. And that has produced this wealth boom in Washington itself. Washington is now one of the richest cities in the country. Indeed, the top three counties in the, count in the country are now around Washington, D.C., as people increasingly recognize that the business of selling policy is an extraordinarily profitable business. This is the sense in which this is an economy, an economy that has produced a dependency, a dependency of our Congress, not as the framers thought upon the people, but upon the funders. They are dependent upon the funders, and that's their focus as they do their job. Yet, the politicians deny this claim. I was told by a member of Congress, it was ridiculous of me to suggest that the money was affecting results. Maybe it was affecting access. That's what he told me. And indeed, congressmen have testified to this, this former congressman from Kentucky. People who contribute get the ear of the member and the ear of the staff. They have the access, and access it is. Access is power. 
but I was told it doesn't change results. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this pretty hard to believe, <laughs> at least if you want to be charitable in interpreting the sort of stuff that Congress does. Because you can look at all these easy cases, the kind of two plus two equal four cases of government that the government just gets wrong. For example, I spent a large chunk of my life fighting in the area of copyright reform. That battle began on October 27, 1998, when then President Bill Clinton signed into a law, into law a statute honoring this great American, Sonny Bono, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, a statute that extended the term of existing copyrights by 20 years. Now, the question which Congress was supposed to be considering as it decided whether to pass this statute was whether such an extension could advance the public good. Because remember, a copyright is offered in exchange for you creating something. If you've created it, extending the copyright can't do any good to the public. It does a lot of good to you, but not to the public. No matter what the United States Congress does, because incentives are prospective, George Gershwin is not going to produce anything more, no matter what term Congress offers him. So this could not, we thought, extend, advance the public good. And when we challenged this statute in the Supreme Court, this left-wing economist, oh wait, I'm sorry, that's Milton Friedman, right-wing Nobel Prize winning economist, agreed to join the brief asserting there could be no advance in the public good, but only if the word no-brainer was in the brief someplace. <laughs> So obvious was it that this could not advance the public good. Yet apparently there were no brains in this place when Congress passed this statute overwhelmingly with two members opposing it, right? An easy public policy question which Congress just gets wrong. Or think again about nutrition. As I said, there's a consensus that we eat too much of this stuff, not enough of this stuff. In 2003, the World Health Organization decided they'd try to advance public policy on the basis of this consensus. So they said, we should adopt standards around the world that say no more than 10% of your daily caloric intake should come from added sugar. Well, the sugar industry, they have this sweet little logo here, <laughs> they went ballistic about this. <laughs> they got the United States Senate to threaten to withdraw funding from the WHO if the WHO didn't back down from their ridiculous suggestion of 10%. Here's the letter from the Senate demanding that they back down. What they wanted, the United States Senate wanted, was that the WHO adopt a standard saying 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. Now, of course, the WHO didn't back down, but our government did. In 2003, the Food Nutrition Board promulgated standards saying 25% of your daily caloric intake could come from added sugar. That's a balanced diet according to our government. So you can start with Fruit Loops or M&Ms for breakfast. You can then have a glass of milk. For lunch, you can have a cheeseburger. For dinner, you can have pepperoni pizza. Indeed, three slices of pepperoni pizza and, of course, sugar cookies for dessert. That's a balanced diet according to the government. Once again, a easy public policy question which our government just gets wrong. Or finally, maybe most profoundly, think about global warming. This is an issue which, of course, there is also now a consensus, or there was until there was a snowstorm in Washington this year. But there's a consensus about global warming that we are doing it. As Al Gore puts it, there are five points in this consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, the consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Now, they wanted to evaluate how solid that consensus was. So there was a study of 1,000 articles in peer-reviewed journals published between 1993 and 2003. And in that 1,000 article sample, they found 0%, exactly zero of those articles that questioned that consensus. Then they did a comparable study of popular media articles in roughly the same period, 1988 to 2002. And they found that 53% of the popular media articles questioned that consensus. And of course, the difference between the science and the popular media was a product of the extraordinary amount of junk science that had been spread into this debate by funders who have a particular and self-interested view of the matter, leading to giving Congress the backing they needed to delay for at least 10 years addressing this 
the planet's most important public policy question. And still, to this day, we don't have a clear picture of when we'll even take the first steps. Again, an easy public policy question which Congress just gets wrong. Now, the point is, in all of these cases, Congress is getting these things wrong either because they're idiots or because they're guided by something other than reason. And my view, I know this is controversial in some parts of the country, but my view is they are not idiots. This is not stupidity. This is completely predictable, understandable results of a system that privately funds public elections. And it's not just in the easy cases. Everywhere, policy gets bent to those who pay with the consequence that we weaken public trust of this institution. The vast majority of Americans polling between 88% and 95%, I don't know who the 5% is here, believes money buys results in Congress, producing extraordinary cynicism about that institution, cynicism which recently manifested itself in a 22% approval rating for the institution. At the time of the revolution, it's likely more people supported the British crown than support our Congress today. Now, recently, when I've been telling this story, some people raise their hand and say, yeah, but what about health care reform? Doesn't health care reform show that Barack has changed DC? Indeed, after the health care uh, vote, Ezra Klein, an extraordinary uh, uh, author, somebody whose views I 98% of the time agree with 100%, wrote this piece about the twilight of the interest groups. He wrote, the Obama administration succeeded at neutralizing every single industry. I wish, Ezra, my view is closer to Glenn Greenwald's view here. Glenn responded to Ezra by saying, if by neutralizing, Ezra means bribing and accommodating them to such an extreme degree that they ended up affirmatively supporting a bill that lavishes them with massive benefits, then he's absolutely right. But being able to force the government to bribe and accommodate you is not a reflection of your powerlessness, quite the opposite. Pretending that this bill represents the twilight of the interest groups, that special interests have been neutralized, is just hagiography and propaganda. The way this bill has been shaped is the ultimate expression and bolstering of how Washington has long worked. One can find reasonable excuses for why it had to be done that way, but one cannot reasonably deny that it was. Reminding me of the 20th century's greatest philosopher, the great... David Bowie, emphasizing, of course, this is the same as it ever was, even with Barack. OK, that's the source. If this is the source of the troubles we've identified, this economy that drives policymakers away from sensible policies, how do we respond to it? What do we do? My suggestion is we take seriously the invocation from the title of this talk. We think about how we reboot. Pick your flavor, it can be that kind of rebooting, or that kind of rebooting, or that kind of rebooting, whatever you want. But we think about how to reboot democracy, and let's take the Windows version of it, Control, Alt, Delete. Because there's a deep message encoded in this key sequence, I promise, watch. Okay, so let's start with Control, right? Who is it that needs to reboot this democracy? Well, my view is we need to accept, those of us who fought passionately to get him elected need to accept, it is not a president who's going to do this for us. Barack Obama told us when he ran for president that these changes were necessary. This is what he said when he was a candidate. For far too long, through both Democratic and Republican administrations, Washington has allowed lobbyists and campaign contributions to rig the system, no matter what it costs ordinary Americans. If we do not change our politics, if we do not fundamentally change the way Washington works, then the problems we've been talking about for the last generation will be the same ones that haunt us for generations to come. If we're not willing to take up that fight by which he meant to change the way Washington works, then real change Change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. He promised us this was his fight. He told us this is why he was running for president. But he has not taken up that fight. Indeed, he's been AWOL 
on that fight, insisting the problem of Congress's corruption is not his concern. His concern is solely the administration, which leads people to say, does Barack Obama believe the president is responsible for the problems we're seeing right now, or does he believe that it is Congress? Now, my view is we have to accept he is not the leader here. Instead, what we need is a different kind of movement, a movement that has certain principles. Number one, that it be a citizen movement. I'm not against politicians. I'm not against all politicians. I'm against a movement that pretends to be centered on politicians. Instead, what we need is a movement that tries to find ordinary citizens as part of this change, a citizen's movement. That is, number two, cross-partisan. There is no fundamental change of a democracy that doesn't include people strongly from all perspectives within that democracy. And what we have to recognize is that even if we don't share common goals in our pursuit of democratic ends, we need to see that we all face a common enemy, a system that has broken the basic dynamic of the way democracy was supposed to work, where when you win, you win, under this democracy, when you win, you lose if what you want to do is to change the status quo. And number three, a movement that tries to restore a certain integrity that was at the core of this extraordinary document. An integrity which is about the link between the democracy and what the people want. The dependency not upon the funders, but upon the people. So what change would get us to that? Well, here's the second signal inside of Control-Alt-Delete. Delete. As Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, told us 102 years ago, what we need to do is delete the corrupting influence inside of elections, which is the private funding of public elections. We need citizen-funded elections, which means a system where, by voluntary choice, candidates opt in to accept small dollar contributions only. So for example, there's a bill in Congress right now, the Larson-Jones bill. Larson is a Democrat from Connecticut. Jones is famous for inventing freedom fries. He's a Republican from North Carolina. The Fair Elections Now Act would say that candidates would opt into a system where they would accept no more than $100 from any citizen, and that would be matched by the government, so it would be worth $500, so that they could raise in small dollar contributions the money they need to run for office. Indeed, this is estimated to raise about 50% more than the total amount raised in the last election. This bill now has 152 co-sponsors in the House. I think there's a very significant chance it will pass in the House this election cycle. And if this sort of bill did become law, it would make it so that no one could believe that it was money that was buying results. It would make it so that we all could believe, as we indeed want to believe, that whatever reason Congress had for making whatever stupid decision Congress made, whether it was because there are too many Republicans or too many Democrats or just not enough attention, it was not because of money. That is the core integrity we need to restore to this process. So how is it we could bring about this change? What are the strategies? Well, you can think about inside the Beltway strategies and outside the Beltway strategies. And inside the Beltway strategy is the sort of stuff that we're supporting in this uh, organization, Change Congress, this, that started this site, Fix Congress First, that attempts to get people to support this bill, the Fair Elections Now Act, by giving a simple way to whip their members into supporting the bill and leading to the 152 co-sponsors we've seen right now. This is a traditional way to get legislation enacted. And increasingly, people are asking, is it going to be enough? A conventional battle, will a conventional battle be enough? Is a person like this likely to walk away from all the money in the world in response to a website activist campaign? And as much as I push and spend hours and hours every single day pushing that campaign, I'm increasingly of the view that the answer is no. That the Inside the Beltway campaign alone is never going to be enough. And then instead, what we need is an outside the beltway campaign. We could say an alternative campaign, an alternative path to forcing change inside of Congress. Now, that alternative path must take account of certain laws of politics, two laws. Number one, in America, politics needs a horse race. 
We don't pay attention to politics. You guys are pretty unique in showing up on a Thursday evening to talk about essentially political issues, and there is no primary happening within the next two months here. Ordinarily, we need a horse race for people to focus on the issues. That's point one. Point two is rebels never win using conventional means. Right? That's what our revolution taught us. That's what Star Wars taught us. That's what. Barack Obama taught us. It was because he had unconventional means, his case, the internet, that he was able to flip the conventional power to achieve something nobody expected he could achieve. So these laws, number one, number two, point to the fact that we need an unconventional horse race here, too, to destabilize DC, to make DC no longer the focus of power, to make the unconventional here possible. And the clue is through the convention that we, in our tradition, have the power to call. So the Constitution, in Article 5, proposes ways to amend the Constitution. And the one way not yet realized is to call a convention, a convention for the purpose of proposing amendments to the Constitution. If 34 states ratified a call for a convention. So imagine it looks something like this. This is the way I dream at night. So we have states begin to increasingly race to the call for a convention as they recognize that this democracy is fundamentally broken and needs some fundamental change. They can call for that convention for any particular purpose, but so long as there are 34 that call, that's enough for whatever purpose. Now many look at this and they find it a little bit too terrifying the idea of a constitutional convention. So there are three things you need to remember here. Number one, remember that all a convention does is propose amendments. Those proposed amendments must be ratified before they actually change the Constitution. Ratified not by referenda, but by legislatures or conventions. So as someone who came from California, I am, of course, terrified by the referenda process. But it's not referenda that would ratify these. 38 states have to ratify this. Meaning one house in 12 states would be, in each of 12 states, would be enough to block any such change. And we need to recognize we have 12 solid red states and 12 solid blue states. So neither side needs to worry that the other side is going to steal the game. And here's number point two to remember. Even if we don't get to 34 states, there's good reason to believe that the very process of pushing this convention would have a transformative effect. Because as Washington um, begins to imagine losing their own control on this process, they will respond through reform that attempts to staunch the reform movement. And indeed, the precedent for this is the only amendment to the Constitution that actually changed the structure of Congress, the 17th Amendment that made the Senate elected. Because the 17th Amendment was only proposed by Congress after all but one state necessary to call for a convention had called for a convention. And Washington was terrified that actually a convention would be called. So they quickly passed this amendment out among the states, and it was ratified. And the move to call for a convention was over. The fear of a convention produced that change, or actually the font was probably something like that. And that was the motivator that produced the kind of reform that otherwise normal politics wouldn't produce. And number three, we need to recognize that this call for a convention is already starting. And unfortunately, it's starting effectively on the far right. There's been a big push in the Wall Street Journal to support the idea of a convention on the right. But fortunately, there are people not on the far right, but on the far too sensible side of the political spectrum that are also beginning to try to take a lead in this. So today, in Rhode Island, one of the most extraordinary representatives from Rhode Island, a Democrat, David Siegel, has introduced a resolution filed today again. Right? This is a dramatic time, and you're supposed to respond with, wow, or something like that. Because it's all about you. We did it for you today. That's why we did it. Um, to call for a convention that conditioned the call on the convention actually narrowing its focus to the particular issues that are identified. And their issue he identified was this need to break 
this corruption in the way we elect Congress. Now, my point is, we, not from the far right, need to be a part of this movement, too. And we can't stand aside as one side takes control and defines what these issues will be. And so Change Congress has also begun to facilitate that through a platform to enable this alternative, callaconvention.org. Callaconvention.org that gives people the opportunity to propose amendments and propose strategies to produce more David Siegels across the country. Control, alt, delete. We need to take control through this alternative path to delete the corruption that is our government today. In this sense, we need to reboot this democracy. Now, one last point before I stop. Let's go back to this incident. March 24th, 1989, Exxon Valdez crashes in the Prince William Sound, sending 11 million gallons of oil into the water. This is, the, this is the broadcast from the captain when this happened. If you want, so you're notified, over. Now, as it might be suggested from the manner in which he made this broadcast, there was a significant question about whether Joseph Hazelwood was intoxicated at the time of the accident. He claimed he wasn't. He said he had only had four vodkas before he'd gotten on the ship. The blood alcohol level in the next morning suggested he must have been at least six times over the legal limit at the time he got on board. He denied that. There was a huge fight about it. The result of the fight leaves in doubt the question whether he, in fact, was intoxicated at the time he captained the ship. But whether there's doubt about his intoxication, there is no doubt about one single relevant fact that he was an alcoholic. His mother testified he had a problem with, ex uh, with alcohol. 1985, Exxon treated him for alcoholism. In 1989, the president said he thought he had mastered the problem. They hadn't noticed that in 1986, he had his license revoked for driving under the influence. And in 1988, he had had his license revoked for driving under the influence. Indeed, at the time he captained the ship, he was not able to drive a VW Beetle because he had no driver's license. But forget, forget for a second, second this man, man, Captain Hazelwood. Think instead about those around Captain Hazelwood. The other officers around Captain Hazelwood, people who could have picked up a phone, people who, while a drunk was driving a super tanker, did nothing. That's unfair. There was one officer of all of them who complained, one. What do we think about them? Now, I ask that question because increasingly, as I think about this problem that brings our government to the standstill it is in right now, I begin to think, we are they. Our society faces critical problems requiring serious attention by institutions that can do something, but we have institutions incapable of giving these problems that attention. They are distracted. They are unable to focus because of their dependency, like pilots playing on a laptop while supposedly landing a plane, or a surgeon flirting during surgery, or half of you with your cell phones as you drive down the highway. There are critical problems here requiring serious attention, and none of these institutions is capable of delivering that attention. And who is to blame for that? Who is responsible for that? Now, it's an ordinary practice in our society to try to find the evil person here responsible for that. 
But my view is it's not the evil people that we need to focus on. It's not the Rob Lagojevich types who are engaging in the kind of crude corruption we need to worry about. It is the good people. It is the decent people. It is the people who could simply have picked up a phone. It is us. It is we, the most privileged in the society, who have an obligation to fix this. Because the most outrageous part is that these corruptions, which are primed by the most privileged in our society, are permitted by the passivity of the most privileged as well. We cannot afford to do nothing about this problem. This problem is bringing this government to its knees. You, please, need to join us in changing this. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take some questions or contributions. No, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Can oh, sorry. I, I hate to add one thing to your list, but it's toxic chemicals. I study one which is put in water supplies of 180 million people. It costs this country billions of dollars. You can't get anybody to pay attention. And first of all, what I mean is I cannot get other professors to pay attention. Of the institutions that you mention, I think the worst is academia. <laughs> Our, my colleagues do not want to study factually problems anywhere. And one of the things that's clear is to do that very often, you need to connect natural science and social science, like toxics that affect behavior and cause crime. And I am considered very, very bad. In fact, I've been ostracized. As one of my colleagues said, quote, there you go with your biology again. <laughs> well, I, I think it's a great point. And um, so I came back to Harvard, leaving Paradise in California to run a five-year project in what we call institutional corruption. And the project is to be a study of different institutions that have exactly this dynamic of corruption. So Congress is the paradigm. But academia is another important institution where academics have a relationship to some influence that undermines either their effectiveness as academics or public trust in the institution. So think of doctors taking money from drug companies, sitting on panels reviewing the drugs. There's nothing unethical about that, nothing illegal about that. But what it leads many people to believe is that what the doctors say is not what's true, it's just what might happen to benefit their funder, or in, in your particular case, there's lots of instances of, of areas of research that nobody wants to pursue because of the retaliatory effects from funders of that field because of this kind of research. The, most, the one that's most uh, recently I've begun to look at is cell phone, um, cell phone da uh, dangers. Um, there's a piece in GQ, which this is not public, so don't tell anybody, but um, <laughs> GQ held it for one year because the cell phone companies threatened to withdraw all advertisement from GQ if it published it. This was a piece that was an, uh, examining the question whether cell phones could plausibly be causing um, a damage, in particular uh, tumors that are located right at the place people put the cell phones. Seems kind of coincidental if it didn't cause that, but you know, right where people put cell phones, at least heavy users have a significant increase, uh, according to some of these studies, in the tumors produced. Um, and what he did was take all of the studies, there's about 350 of those studies, and separate them out into studies funded by industry and studies independent of industry. And what he found was a perfect mirror effect. Studies funded by industry, 75% of the time, found no correlation between cell phone usage and harm. Studies funded independently, 75% of the time, found a strong correlation between cell phone use and harm. And 25% were the deviants in both sides. So once you hear that fact, 
I think most people now are a little bit concerned about this matter because the very fact of me telling you about the funding leads you to have less faith in what I think most of you believed before you came into this, that cell phones weren't causing any harm. But the significant fact related to what you're saying is, in the United States, there's almost no funding of research of this. Outside of the United States, there's lots of funding, but in the United States, almost no funding uh, because of the fear that the industry will retaliate in this particular way, and again, because of our government. In 1996, Congress passed a law that forbids any lawsuit that alleges that cell phone towers might be causing cancer or harm. You can't even try to prove it in court. And of course, they brought that into the legislation because the telecom industry spent millions of dollars to get that amendment into the telecom bill of 1996. So in the United States, we won't know until it is way too late whether these devices have caused or will cause significant increase in cancer. Uh, and again, it's because of exactly this kind of corruption. So I agree with you. The Academy, too, needs to clean up its act to preserve the independence that allows us to trust what it says when it says it as being true. Mr. Usenix. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the great presentation, and uh, in general, I agree with you, but let me play uh, devil's advocate for a second. Uh, so, I originally come from Russia, which recently transitioned to kind of uh, pseudo-democracy, and it, it, it strives to be like the U.S., right? It's uh, so nominally, but what happens is there are two observations people made. So first, that bribery is the most efficient um, way to get something done in a bureaucracy. So the government bureaucracy is generally slow and is interested, but uh, if some official is bribed, he becomes the uh, the best uh, uh, partner in business uh, and very uh, pleasing um, uh, to deal with. Uh, so there's one thing. So so the, some people actually go as far to say that uh, bribery is natural to any kind of government and any collective rule, and they basically justify that uh, any alternative is very hard to come by with which works. So if you, for instance, want to replace uh, existing election system with public funding, so what happened in Russia and existed before, any kind of public funding is done by some groups of people who are not charted, so their, their loyalties and interests are hard to, to gauge. And what happens, they collude with the same shady uh, influencers, uh, which might be business or KGB or somebody else, and they basically, you know, so you come to them with some forms. So instead of money, you bring forms saying, I want to be a candidate in the election, say, you know, your scribble, your signature is wrong, so, uh, and you're not from here, and we don't like you, therefore we don't put you on the ballot. And then these people have no recourse. So, so the problem with public funding is how, uh, and, for, and uh, what if somebody wants to sabotage public funding, they come and, and take all the resources. So you have to either put them all on, on the ballot or, or none of them. And so it becomes very harsh. So the money becomes some kind of a natural way, uh, which is a bad way, but still not everybody can get the money, right? So the, so the argument goes that it's still a mechanism. So I wonder um, how do you want to make the public mechanism more efficient than the corrupt mechanism? Yeah, so let's be clear about the claims about efficiency and, and bribery. Um, it is true that um, economists have specified models under which, given inefficient bureaucracies, bribery actually increases the efficiency or at least certainly the return to those who are bribing. And I don't think there's any ambiguity about that with respect to the kind of cases I'm talking about either. ADM is a profitable company because it engages in this legalized bribery that is the system of government we have right now. And if they didn't, all of their ethanol projects would be worthless. All of their ability, their ability to sell um, uh, high fructose corn syrup would disappear. All of these things which are their markets would evaporate because they would be living under a free market as opposed to the stacked market that we've got right now. So there's no question that from their perspective it's better, but the question, but the, the question about which there isn't much argument I think in general is that if you could build an efficient bureaucracy and a trustworthy government, um, it's better not to have these kinds of rent-seeking bribes than uh, to have them. Now, I don't like to talk about other countries in this context because I think you know, it's very complicated to try to understand exactly at what stage of development different countries are at. The United States went through a period, the 19th century the United States Congress was a cesspool of that kind of corruption. Um, uh, you know, even people we think of as heroes today were explicitly on the pay 
of people who needed um, money. Uh, Daniel Webster was paid by the Bank of the United States. And he writes a famous letter where he says, if the Bank of the United States wants to have his continued support, then they better up the ante for the following year. I mean, it's like as plain, as obvious as anything could be. But I think it's an enormous benefit in our tradition that we've actually gotten over at the federal level in the most part, that kind of corruption. Of course, there still are Randy Duke Cunningham's or Jefferson, uh, Congressman Jefferson. Those people still exist. But in the main, our institution is not filled with people who are trying to figure out how they can bribe or cheat in order to get a lot of money for themselves. But the, but the problem is that people then think, well, that means that we've got a perfectly fine system. <laughs> and, and my point is, actually, the harm done by the bribery in the open, kind of in plain sight, corruption that we've got right now, is much worse than the bribery and the cost to the society that was done by the old kind of corruption. I mean, you know, when a congressman used to find a way to get a $50,000 payment on something, OK. He got $50,000. He shouldn't have gotten $50,000. But not such a big deal. But the corruption that led to the collapse of the financial system in 2008, that was a huge deal, continues to be a huge deal to many, many people who don't have bailouts to bail them out of the catastrophe that that produced. And global warming and food safety and any number of these issues you can point to, the consequence of this in the open corruption is much, much worse. Now, with respect to the um, public funding systems, I, you know, we need a better word than public funding because there's an old style of public funding, which is about the government decides that your district gets a million and a half dollars, and your district gets a million dollars, and that's how much an election's going to cost, and we're going to hand out money like that. I'm against that system. I don't think bureaucrats should be in the business of deciding how much money people should have to run elections. The system I'm talking about are bottom-up small dollar contribution systems. So as, a, as an individual, I have the power to give a candidate up to $100 in contributions. When the candidate gets that contribution, the candidate can trade that in for four to one match from the government. That's a mechanism. There's no, it, there's no discretion in that process. It's just a mechanism. Another system, which I actually think would be a better system, imagines democracy vouchers, where every citizen has a $50 democracy voucher. They can allocate however they want. Conservatives like education vouchers. I like democracy vouchers. Um, that democracy voucher system would produce $6 billion in spending in congressional elections. In the 2008 election, there was $1.4 billion spent. So that would be an enormous amount of money in the system that would drive members away from taking special interest contributions. So I agree with you in principle. You need to worry about whether the system is corrupt in this old style sense of corruption. But I think we need to leverage the extraordinary benefit we have as a nation that that's not our problem. But we have a much more serious problem we need to address by a system like a public funding system. Uh, right over here. Thank you. Um, thank you for your speech. Um, I come from China, so it was kind of extremely interesting to look at America's democracy as an outsider. Because in China, we talk a lot about how we should learn from America as a democracy. But now you're talking about rebooting democracy here in America. So um, my question is, I think your, your speech, I mean, you made everything look very simple, and which is necessary because you're helping us to look beyond the obvious and to find a solution. But I mean, the issue is kind of much more complicated than that. One of the complexities I see, and you also talk about it, because when we talk about democracy, we think about the political uh, reform, but you said we ordinary American and ordinary people need to take actions not only for a common goal but a common economy. So here the question is that when, when we try to reform the political structure, we can't forget the, uh, how the economy works. So I wonder, uh, in your opinion, how the economic uh, system should work and how the ordinary citizen should participate in that system which I think it's very important. Another thing I want to talk about is like, like a personal observation, because I've been here in America for one year, and there was, there was once I went to a party, and then I saw uh, what the host put on their refrigerator is kick the government out of the kitchen. That's what they put on the fridge. And also some of my friends talked to me like this, oh, I'm not a big fan of the government. And also, um, 
I guess last month there was a release about how American people trust the government. I mean, the trust level has been decreasing dramatically. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes me f think about my country, because in China we talk a lot about government. When we have an issue, we say, oh, the government should do something. So the ordinary people trust the government. But here, it makes me feel there is a gap between the, um, the citizenship and the government. And, and that reminds me of Max Weber's concept of civil society. And what you're talking about makes me feel that you're trying to build a civil society, which means the citizenship is very well informed and the government is becoming smaller. So I was wondering, is civil society possible at all? And how are you going to uh, re-educate American to, to remind themselves that it is important to have a capable government? Um, so basically my question is, number one, how should the economic system be operated not only we talk about the political reform, and the second question is that how are you going to raise people's awareness of the importance of a government, and also is civil society possible at all? Thank you very much. Yeah. So thank you. That's a great question. Um, um, so number one, I, I, you know, I was born a Republican, raised a Republican. I grew up, I became a Democrat, but, um, but I spent many years, <laughs> many years as a firm believer in the free market system. And nothing I'm saying should be read as a criticism of the free market system, even though there's lots to criticize. That's not my beef. My beef is with the f capitalism using government power to benefit itself, as opposed to competing in the marketplace. So when I criticize uh, ADM, it's not because ADM has come up with some fantastic new product that is winning in the marketplace. It's because ADM is using its power over the political system to get laws that subsidize one form of production and tax another form of uh, uh, production in order to benefit them. So I think we need to recognize the free market is like a tiger. Okay? Now, when a tiger is little, it looks like a kitten. But even though it looks like a kitten, you'd be very stupid to let your child play with a kitten tiger, or especially as the tiger grows older. We need to understand the tiger has a nature to it. And its nature is to try to make as much money as it can. And our job has got to be to frame or to cage that tiger so that it can make as much money as it can and make profit and wealth for society without doing harm to society. And so we need to focus on ways that we can get it to flourish without doing harm. And you know, that's why I think that it's important to celebrate its value and its ability to produce wealth while not allowing it to set its own rules. And this was the biggest mistake that they made during the financial deregulation. They said, well, we used to have bureaucrats making rules. Now we're going to allow the, the industry to self-regulate <laughs> so that when they faced a rule which they could break and make billions of dollars or obey and not make billions of dollars, of course, we're going to trust them to do the right thing. That's what Alan Greenspan was saying. He was shocked that they sacrificed the long-term interests of the firm for their short-term gain. He was shocked by that. I'm not shocked by that. They're tigers. Give them children to play with, they will eat them. That's what they do. <laughs> So I'm, ag I'm for the market, but, I need, but I'm against the market using government to protect itself. Number two, about the, the quote of American libertar libertarianism. You're right. Most Americans are very skeptical of the government, and for good reason. The government has done a terrible job for many, many years in doing the stuff the government should be doing. And it's, you know, it, I, I spent, last week I was at Yahoo, and I was at the Yahoo Labs, and I, I was with some Yahoo researchers, and they were insanely brilliant researchers. Um, most of them were from Russia and from China and from other places around the world, but you know, they had attracted the very best researchers to this place, and they were brilliant. And I asked one of them, a Russian, you know, wouldn't these techniques he was describing be really useful for the government to solve the particular problem we were talking about the government? He said, absolutely. And I spent six months in Washington trying to get them to understand this. But after six months, I just thought it was hopeless, and I gave up, and I came back to Yahoo. Now, there this brilliant guy 
is spending all of his energy to make sure that Yahoo can earn another $20 million in advertising revenue, rather than taking his extraordinary energy and devoting it to solving really serious problems the government has with pricing mechanisms. But of course, he's not going to waste his time doing that, because our government is pathetic in its ability to deal with these kinds of problems. So I'm not against people. I don't think people are irrational for criticizing the government. But I think they're irrational for believing that we're going to be able to survive the kind of issues that we face without fixing the government. Right, so when somebody says they want the government out of their kitchen, I do too. I don't want corn to be subsidized by the government anymore. I don't want sugar prices to be increased by the government anymore. I want a, I want a system where vegetables are not 20% more expensive relative to where uh, uh, meat is, so that at least poor people and all of us can begin to eat a healthy diet the way, of course, the Chinese have for many years preserved the extraordinary vegetable based diet that has produced extraordinary health in China. It's a great book. I'm sure you've seen the China study, which tries to evaluate health consequences of diets in a way that is quite profound. So if you really want the government out of your kitchen, then some of the su su suggestions that I'm talking about I think are important. Now, about civil society, I actually think we have a pretty good civil society. America, one of the greatest things about America is the enormous amount of um, charity, that we provide to institutions inside the United States, one of the biggest in the world. Of course, we don't do much to foreign aid, but for our own, we do an amazing job. And there are all sorts of institutions that are able to rally people to do amazing things. But one of the problems I think we face is that we spend so much time on civil society to the expense of spending time on political society. So we think the best way to deal with an environmental issue is to go picket Starbucks so that Starbucks uses corrugated cardboard rather than you know, unrecycled cardboard, rather than figuring out how to elect a government that will impose rules on Starbucks so Dar Starbucks does the right thing about whatever type of product they use. We channel all our energy into civil society and not enough into political society. And that produces the failed government that leads people to be so cynical. So uh, I think we have to accept the cynicism, but we need to leverage the power of the civil society to produce um, some fundamental changes to government. This court has been adding, acting extremely erratically. Um, I don't believe that there's anything in Larson uh, Jones that is unconstitutional. And the court has signaled a number of times that public funding proposals or small dollar contribution proposals are a fair alternative to the kind of speech restricting proposals that were inside of McCain-Feingold. The problem with McCain-Feingold is, is it told somebody not to speak. And while I believe that the issue is actually much more complicated than the court put it and their simple ruling was a mistake, there's a big difference between the government intervening to say you can't speak and the government intervening to say, OK, we're going to make it easier for people to speak by funding elections in the following way. Because what, what, what Larson Jones does is increase speech, not reduce speech. And the trigger in the court's head is, have you taken a step that is effectively restricting the speech of someone? Um, now, under the, our, our Supreme Court jurisprudence, the, the Congress doesn't have the power to force members of Congress to limit their contributions to $100. That would be a violation of the Buckley rule. But by creating an option for candidates to opt into this system, you're respecting the free speech interests of the candidate themselves. Because if I were running for Congress, I would want to signal to all of my constituents that I don't want big dollar contributions, special interest contributions. That's a way of me saying, this is the kind of candidate I want to be, or this is the kind of congressperson I want to be. So it respects the free speech interests of the candidates. It doesn't restrict anybody's speech, and it adds more speech into the marketplace. And I believe that should be enough to make it constitutional. Um, but the court has surprised us before. Um, so it may be that that's not enough. Now, the other part of the question, which, you know, just to be frank about it, um, everybody knows about the Citizens United decision at the beginning of the year. January 21st, a, day, a year and a day after Barack Obama was elected president, the decision says that Corporations have an unlimited right to spend whatever they want, independent expenditures in congressional campaigns. So it's first important to keep that in perspective. I told you that Congress in 2008 cycle spent $1.4 billion total. If you take 1% of the profits of the Fortune 400 in 2008, 
that would be $6 billion. So if they take their newfound freedom and they just devote 1% of their profits to exploiting it, they would be quadrupling the amount of money that's inside the elections directed towards corporate interests. And what's more troubling about this is there's some great research that's recently been done, something called the iceberg theory of political contributions, which says that the most important political contribution is not the cash you give, but the threat you make that you're going to give money to the other side. So it's just the same if I give you $10,000 as if I give you $2,000 and threaten to give your opponent $8,000. Now that paper, which is a mathematical paper and has some empirical data to support it, was written at the time when PACs were limited to giving $5,000 to a particular candidate. Um, so the numbers they calculated were in a world where there were limits. But when you imagine no limits, the capacity for corporations to deliver credible threats that drive Congress people to do what they want them to do is an order of magnitude greater than what it is right now. You can walk into a district and Exxon can walk in and say, we don't want to have to spend $10 million to elect a congressperson who believes that Al Gore was smoking weed when he came up with this stuff about global warming, but we will if we have to. And in that context, what are you as a member of Congress or a candidate for Congress going to do? Like, what, what could you credibly do? Now, the Supreme Court said, don't worry about that. We can have disclosure rules to disclose that Exxon has um, spent $10 million. That's true. If Exxon spends $10 million, we can disclose that. But the whole point about this iceberg theory is that the biggest power comes from the threat, not the actual money spent. And you don't have to disclose a threat. So the real power here will never be disclosed to anybody. We'll never know exactly what the forces are that are driving members to do one thing or the other. Now, will Larson Jones solve that problem? I don't think so. I think ultimately we're gonna have to think about a more fundamental change in light of this particular change. But what I do know is we're not gonna have a Congress willing to make that change unless we get a clean Congress that is produced by something like a Larson Jones bill. So I think this is the first step of many steps we're going to have to take to reform this democracy. Um, right here. Two questions. The first one is quick, which is when was the last time we had a constitutional convention? Was it the ERA? Are we? What, yeah. First, the last time we had a constitutional convention was 1787. Oh. Or, well, we, we, I mean, the called for one. I mean, the ERA. The call for one. There's, there's been a bunch of calls for a convention. Okay. And indeed, when we called for a convention, there's this very funny little click movement of people who believe that there are already enough calls for a convention. We just have to get Congress to recognize that. And they are angry that we suggest that we need to have more calls for a convention. Because if you add up the number of calls, there's something like 245 different calls for a convention over 200 years, and none of them had a time limit in them. So they say, see, that's enough. We have enough right now. Um, so we've only gotten close, really close, with the 17th Amendment. That was one call short. OK, my bigger kind of question and point is capitalist enterprises have always been involved in the government and, ha and to, to influence the government to regulate in ways that protect them and advance them. And so just two historical studies, Charles Perrault's study of the railroads and also of the manufacturing industry in the United States. So what you are saying is something different than that because that has always been true and it's true in every capitalist society. In Europe, it's the same. Now their elections are different. And so I'm trying, you know, is it just the funding of the elections that is the key problem of the influence in government? Or is that just a tip of the iceberg? Or, or what, what's the, why is that more significant than the role that they, has always, of influence on regulation and, and policy? Yeah. So I think that business has always got to be involved in government in the following sense. Government will regulate. Business needs to tell government what's sensible regulation and not sensible regulation. So I'm not against lobbyists. I think we need lots of lobbyists in Washington. But as John Edwards used to say when we used to quote John Edwards, um, <laughs> there's all the difference in the world between a lawyer making an argument to a jury and a lawyer handing out $100 bills to the jurors. right? And that's the distinction that doesn't exist in lobbying right now. Because lobbyists have now become conduits through which money is raised 
for a campaign. Now, never directly, because that's a violation of Title 17, um, but indirectly. Like, there's a very subtle mechanism that everybody knows how to do the dance in Washington, and that subtle mechanism produces understandings about how money is going to be raised in exchange for certain activities happening. Um, now, some political scientists always come in and say, you know, We've done studies, and, and we can't find a correlation between contributions and roll call votes. You know, and it's like, excuse me, it would be a crime if there were such a correlation. So it's not surprising that it's not so obvious, right? And, and as I was saying at lunch, there's a great quote by Barney Frank where he says, Washington's the sort of city where you never write if you can call, you never call if you can speak, you never speak if you can uh, nod, and you never nod if you can wink. Right? And so the idea is you constantly try to find ways to hide what you're doing so that the meaning is conveyed, but nobody else gets to see the meaning. Um, so I want there to be a relationship. I just don't want there to be this particular kind of relationship. Now, how do we compare to other nations? Well, there are big differences, uh, two uh, significant, uh, two in particular. One is constitutional, well, they're both constitutional. One is free speech related. No other country has the kind of free speech rules that we do. So in other countries, you can restrict the time of a campaign. You can restrict the money that's going to be spent. You can restrict television to say that you have to give free television time to these people. All of those are things which in the United States, according to our Supreme Court, the First Amendment forbids. And number two, those are all typically parliamentary systems. And the money is given to the parties. And in our system, we have 535 uh, arbitrage makers, right? They're, they're sort of dealing and making their deals with a special interest um, to benefit whatever their particular interest is in that time. That's a pretty significant change. But even those two differences, I don't think quite get to it because, again, this is why I think the Kaiser book is so important. We have to recognize there's been a very important change that's happened recently because of a number of things that have come together in a kind of perfect storm. Number one, Counterintuitively, competition has increased. So not competition in local seats, because there are you know, plenty of safe seats, but competition in the parties at the national level. So when the Republicans took over for the first time in 40 years, 1995, um, uh, all of a sudden, the Democrats got a taste for being in the minority, and they didn't like it. And the Republicans got a taste for being in the majority, and they really liked it. So both parties, from that point on, were incentivized to spend an enormous amount of energy to try to raise money to make sure that they could regain control of the House and the Senate. Number two, the Supreme Court began to send clear signals to the FCC that they weren't going to allow the FCC to impose regulations on television networks to keep the cost of television advertisement low during campaigns. So the cost of television advertisement goes up dramatically. So the cost of campaigns are going up. Competition is going up. And so there's a strong push to raise more money for an ever, uh, you know, ever increasing competition between these two parties. And as that happens, the norms of Congress change. So that was the contrast between Stennis and Bacchus. Um, but uh, again, Cooper tells the story. Cooper was elected, and when he was elected, he was one of the youngest people elected since the founding. He then served and when, ran for Al Gore's seat when Gore became vice president. He lost. He went to the private sector, and he came back in about, I think he came back in 2000. Um, so he has a very long time horizon. He said when he went to Congress, the Democratic caucus would get together. They would argue about politics. They would say, is it a good idea for us to bring this bill? Or what will happen to the votes in, in uh, Detroit if we bring that bill? Like it was what you hope politicians talk about, like the political value of certain decisions versus another. He says today, Democratic caucus gets together, and what they do is talk about whether you've raised your quota. So members have a quota depending on what their seniority is and what their district is, of how much they have to raise for the party. And they go around and say, you've raised yours, you haven't raised yours. And they begin to punish people who don't raise what they're supposed to raise by withholding tiny little things like whether you get a page or something like that, or whether committee chairs are now allocated on the basis of you know, the ability to raise money like this. So the whole focus has become focused now on this money. And you know, again, if you're, raise, if you're spending 30 to 70% of your time with an earphone, headphone, dialing people you've never met, asking them for money to run for your life, you can understand why that's their focus. Um, all of this has happened relatively recently. And, and the consequence of that is, um, is the, this particular change. And there's one more bit to add to it. I just want to make sure people say this. So we have this perception that America is polarized. And in fact, the political classes are polarized. But the political classes represent a small portion of America. And if you take the non-political classes of America, we're not polarized. We are a standard bell curve, 
depend, I don't know where on the left-right uh, continuum we are, but we're standard bell curve. The political classes, though, are increasingly separated. Now, if you've got to raise money, what fundraisers know is the best way to raise money is to be extreme. So if you want to raise money from people on the right, be more extreme on the right. If you want to raise people from the left, raise money from people on the left, be more extreme on the left. So the point is this need to raise money in the political classes drives them to become even more polarized. So we have an increasingly polarized political class, which most of America looks at and says, I don't even recognize those people. I mean, they watch MSNBC or Fox and they say, this is, you know, this is a different country. I don't come from this country. I don't, you know, I don't, I, you know it's entertaining, it's fun to watch, but I, I don't understand what these people are talking about anymore. And so they become disconnected from politics. They don't want to vote, they don't want to turn out, they don't want to do anything because it's not their problem. That's not who they are. Um, so my point is, you know, if part of the polarization is being caused by the way we're funding elections, that's yet another very compelling reason to think about how to fund elections differently. Uh, somebody on my far right need to be balanced in this respect. Um, thank you so much for a really stimulating talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, I'm very susceptible to your suggestion to us that we're responsible. Um, but I wanted to ask you about cynicism about the professorial class, because it seems to me that American academics have also been ostracized in certain kinds of ways that are gonna make us very very hard for us to do the sort of work that you're talking about. And I am, in relation to that, I'm a professor of literature. I'm really appreciative of your use of the word rhetoric, the very um, convincing rhetoric that you used yourself in the process of giving the talk. Um, I'm really worried about complexity and trying to communicate complexity because it seems to me that when I look with my naive, non trained political eyes at what has changed in America about our democracy is not just polarization, but incredible simplification. That nobody has patience for any argument that lasts more than half a sentence. And we've been with you here for almost an hour and 45 minutes, and I think many of us in the room are incredibly grateful for that. But I can't think of so many people in my neighborhood or in my classrooms in some cases who could sit that long to hear the argument. So could you speak to those two issues a little bit, please? Uh, I'm sorry, we don't have time for that question. <laughs> I'm always being tripped up by people on my right. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I genuinely, I completely agree with increasing skepticism about the professorial class. Not because of political bias. Obviously, we all have our politics, and I think it's fair. You know, anybody should, fairly should be able to believe. If you want to be a leftist or a rightist, that's fine. But in my business, at least, an increasing number of professors are selling out for money. Um, so this issue came home to me when um, uh, Senator Sununu, you might have heard of him, um, uh, was sitting on a committee where I was testifying and he sent me an email and he said, you shouldn't be out there shilling for those big internet companies. And it struck me, he thought I was being paid by Google to give the testimony I was giving. And I thought, oh my God, that's, a, that's terrifying. And then I thought, well, of course he thinks I'm being paid because everybody is being paid now to give this kind of testimony, public policy testimony. So you know, the, we, it's extraordinarily rare in our society to have people who are allowed to say what they believe without fear of consequence to their financial status. That's what professors are. That's what we're supposed to be. And you know, you can be you know, a Bloomberg and be a billionaire and you're free to say what you want, not worry about it. Um, but very few other people in our society have that freedom. You know, if you're a lawyer, you can't say what goes against the interests of your client. If you work for IBM, you can't say what goes against the interests of IBM. So everybody else in professional classes is constrained, but we uniquely have a freedom that our society depends upon. Like we have to have independent voices in our society. Now, I'm the last person to say we should turn the government over to the professors. Right? <laughs> that would be a disaster. But I do believe that we ought to have you know, the opportunity for professors to maintain that integrity and that independence. And I'm strongly against 
the move in our profession for people to sell that asset to the highest bidder. So in that sense, I think there's something to worry about. And I, again, the institutional corruption project that we're working on is focusing on this problem as well. The other problem is really, really, really impossibly hard and increasingly hard. You know, um, as you know, teaching, I don't know if you allow kids to have laptops while you're teaching. Uh, yeah. Well, there's an increasing backlash, of course, against it. When I, you know, I, I did all this work in cyberspace technology and cyberspace regulation from the early part of my career. And when I was at Harvard initially, I was the Berkman professor, which is a big internet professor. And they just began to put Wi Fi in the classrooms, and I was violently against it. And one of the, my colleagues said, You're being so paternalistic. And I said, yeah, I am a professor teaching a class, and it's my job to tell them how they are supposed to learn. That's what I do. And I know that you give them the opportunity to surf while you're lecturing. They're not, you know, they, they just can't help themselves. But when it's getting to be too hard, they're going to spend their time looking elsewhere. And, and you know, we, we have the hottest growing technology is a technology that restricts you to 140 characters. Um, <laughs> How much can you say in 140? So I completely agree with you that this is a significant problem. But I, but I guess I believe it's, it's a significant challenge to getting people to think about these issues. Now, you know, I had the opportunity to give you an hour and, uh, so, and some change in giving you a talk. So I gave you a talk in a certain form. But I do think there's a way to bring people into this debate. I do think there's a way to begin to leverage people's anger into understanding these issues. Because when I first started doing the issues around copyright, what I got when I, stared, when I spoke to the audience was a kind of blank stare. They didn't understand what the issue was about. Like, why shouldn't Mickey Mouse be owned by Disney for the rest of time? And, and, and why shouldn't people be able to protect? You know, so what we had to do is both educate people and then persuade them. But with this issue, there's no education necessary. Everybody already believes that our system is corrupted in this way. They start with that belief. And the, the only education I think we need to do is to get people to connect the dots, as I was saying. Like, you care about health care, just recognize that we're not going to get health care reform, real health care reform, until we solve this problem. You care about global warming, we're not going to get real global warming legislation until we solve this problem. You care about any of the issues you care about, we're not going to get any reform until we change this problem. Until, and when people begin to see the collection of issues, then maybe we can get them to begin to focus on this more progressive um, in the traditional sense, not leftist progressive, but progressive in the let's change the process sense uh, uh, of stuff. But I, you know, I spend many nights laying awake thinking, how is this ever done? You know, you know, you don't run for president. How do you do it? Right? And we saw somebody run for president. Make this his issue. This is what distinguished him from Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was quite honest in her. You know, lobbyists are people too. They represent real people. You know, they're just part of the process. We're just going to work with them. And Barack and the man whose name we cannot utter um, said, uh, no, lobbyists are the problem. That's the thing we have to change. That's the, that is why the system is broken. And it turned out, apparently, you can't be president and continue to maintain that view. Um, uh, so I, I genuinely agree this is an impossibly difficult problem. But what is our choice here? You know, you, you, you come home from the doctor and the doctor tells you your kid has terminal cancer. You know, the fact that it's terminal cancer does not change what you do. You fight it as hard as you possibly can with every ounce of energy you've got because you believe and you love the child and you love this country and the traditions it stands for. And we all have to recognize that however impossible we think this problem is, we have no choice as citizens, but to fight it. So you might be right, but I hope you're wrong. <laughs>
June 21st marks the six-month anniversary after Citizens United. After Citizens United was decided, all sorts of congressmen ran to the floor of the Congress and said, we need a constitutional amendment to deal with this issue, and we are going to start a constitutional amendment. And they raised millions of dollars in these campaigns for a constitutional amendment. There has not yet been one amendment that has been considered by the United States Congress. And there will never be an amendment considered by the United States Congress because everybody can count to 67 and realize there's not anywhere close to 67 votes in the United States Senate. So rather than this charade that tries to deal with what we all should see as a fundamental problem of our democracy, we need to move to a political system that is not part of the problem. And I believe states are what our founders thought the ultimate check on a corrupted government to be. Right? It was the states that we go to when the government got corrupted that have the power to begin to call for a convention. So um, I think what you need to do is to find, out the, find the state representatives in New Hampshire who can follow David Siegel in Rhode Island and get a, convention, and get a resolution to call for a convention in, in uh, New Hampshire. We've got representatives in Washington, who are, Washington State, who are going to do it very shortly after David Siegel does it, and we can begin to this process. And what, it's, and what I think is so, such a great opportunity about this process, and here the internet really helps, the internet in this attention span issue, is in some sense it becomes like presidential primaries. Right? Each state is another event. And as it happens, two or three percent more of the American public begins to pay attention to the issue. Like, and so slowly you begin to seep into the consciousness of the public that this is an issue they need to think about. And after you get to 10 states or 15 states, then all the networks begin to focus on it. Another state has voted for a convention. And then we begin to have, it's going to take a long time, year-long, two-year-long conversation as a nation about what should we do. Uh, and then once the convention happens, and imagine what that would look like. Right? There's no Democratic Party or Republican Party to script the convention. There's, you know, the most extraordinary kind of C-SPAN coverage of whatever this crazy thing would be, but I actually think we could do something useful. Producing a, a debate, producing proposals, and then the process of getting 38 states to pass any of those proposals. It's a long process, um, five years to get to some reform. Um, would you be willing to meet with the New Hampshire state rep? I would, you know, I, any excuse to come back to Dartmouth would be. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I can't come to Dartmouth. I understand, but um, I would stop on the way. Uh, yeah, no, I would. I, of course, of course. This is. I'm committed to this issue. Oh, I know you. Yeah, on Twitter. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you can. It's, so my email address is lessig at law.harvard.edu. Send me an email address. Okay, one last question from the far left. Yes, finally. <laughs> when we um, take a look at our Uncle Mike, uh, and we look at uh, the issue from a little bit of a <coughs> higher perspective, it seems to me as if the real danger that we have in the country is that we've gotten very used to and very addicted to uh, living in debt. All right. right now, we just crossed the $13 trillion mark. Um, when we um, hear about uh, you know, the problems and we look at the, you know, what, what uh, President Obama has actually come up against, it's the reality hits when you have to, in fact, pay the interest on $13 trillion. And so basically what is happening, I think, and that is that we're starting to, in fact, see this, 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 this kind of this addiction, okay, now it's being reflected you know, throughout the political spectrum. So the question that comes up, and that is that maybe the way that we actually start to solve this problem is by taking you know, some very, very unpalatable medicine okay, on the part of all Americans in terms of you know, addressing um, this debt and how to reduce this debt. And that will, in fact, then give the, um, you know, the hopefully the next generation of politicians more freedom, more flexibility to, in fact, enact uh, legislation uh, that will that will kind of push us forward, but to me it seems like right now is that our, our, the biggest issue that we have facing in the country is really the the um, you know kind of almost the, the constraints that we have based upon the financial uh, realities. Um, how's that fit into where you want to go? Well, so let's take the metaphor again. Uncle Mike was that who it was, or Uncle Bob, whoever it was, the the alcoholic uncle. 
lost his job and is addicted to alcohol. So you think, well, by gosh, because he's lost his job, he doesn't have any resources. And so he's really struggling to make ends meet. Um, so we have two problems to solve, the resources problem and the addiction problem. And my view is there's a logical order to those two problems. Right? If you pile a bunch of money into Uncle Bob's pockets while he's still addicted, you can spend it on alcohol. Right? Um, but if you get him to solve the addiction, um, then maybe he's in a better chance to figure out how to spend the money in a way that gets him back to where he needs to be. And, that, and that's, I think, the perfect metaphor for this problem. You know, we face enormously difficult problems as a nation. Global warming, healthcare, the debt, the financial service, whatever. Um, but we won't solve any of those problems until we solve this first problem first, right? the addiction that our members have on private money. Um, so it's not like that addiction is the most important problem. It's not. It's just the first problem. Um, uh, and so that's, that's I think, got to be the recognition of the steps towards getting us back to being a healthy democracy. And, and so I, I'm all for figuring out what are the difficult steps we need to take in order to solve what is ultimately a much more serious problem in the sense that um, I don't know how to solve it. Um, but I really think we have to make the institution capable of thinking reasonably about how to solve that more serious problem. Um, Do we get more money from corporations on taxes or individuals? Um, we get, actually, the way that distribution works is that if you take just the amount of taxes being paid by uh, people, it turns out uh, rich people pay a huge chunk of the actual income that comes into taxes. Um, and the corporations, it's not the tax rate, but the actual effective taxes that they pay. And I don't know what the actual number is, but it's not a huge por portion compared to the private um, that's coming in. Yeah, because 15% of 2.5 billion is $375 million. Um, so one of the things that you know, when Brown in the UK threatened to, in fact, uh, put uh, restrictions on the hedge funds, you know, all the, you know, the commercial property in Zurich went up. Um, so one of the things that we, that I'm sure is being used as leverage, and that is, you know, the old days, you know, you know, you know it's good for General Motors, it's good for the United States, but it's good for business, it's good for the U.S. I, and I think that is, is being used, you know, um, you know as, a, as a lever. It might be, but, I don't, but the point is we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, think again about the Supreme Court. You know, so I'm a constitutional law professor. I spend my life criticizing the Supreme Court. Um, but the one thing neither I nor anybody serious would say is that the Supreme Court decides what it decides because of money. Um, so they've earned an extraordinary kind of institutional capital. We trust at least that this bit of corruption is not inside of what they're doing. They might be too political, might be too concerned about being Republican or being Democrat, but they're not deciding what they're doing because of the money. So if the court decided a case which was effectively a what's good for GM is good for America case, you know, I'd think hard about it. Um, I'd want to take it seriously. But the point is, I would take it seriously because I don't believe it's being driven by this um, venal kind of concern. But right now, none of us, when we confront a decision Congress makes that we disagree with, take it seriously. <laughs> we, all of us, instantly think it's because of the money, even if it's not. That's just what we think. So we can't get going in taking democracy seriously until we can trust it. And so that's why, even though I agree this is, you're talking about a much more serious, difficult problem, I'm talking about the problem we have to solve first. So here's the final pitch. Fixcongressfirst.org is our website. Fixcongressfirst.org. You can sign up to learn about what we're doing. You can even sign up and never be asked for money. So we have an option to opt out of fundraising, if you'd like. Um, but please sign up so that we can build a stronger group of people to make this fundamental change. I'm grateful you would spend your Thursday night here. Thank you very much.